All right, let's try this one again. I don't know if you guys saw my last one, but my internet speed was so slow that I don't think that anything came through. Um, hopefully this one is, and hopefully I'm gonna catch some of you guys here uh, live for this broadcast. But I hope you guys are doing well. We're going back with uh, round two here uh, to keep myself building my voice <laughs> muscles up and my vocal cords so that when I have my uh, sync up event here in a couple weeks, I will have a nice strong voice for it and I won't lose it. Um, you know, one of my worst nightmares is I'm sitting there having to give tons of presentations in front of all of you guys virtually and in person and I can't speak like that would just be horrible. Um, or I'd have to learn sign language pretty quick. So this is my attempt at essentially training myself a little bit for a lot of speaking and a lot of engagements that's going to be coming up. Um, but in this feedback or this feedback, this uh, one hour um, uh, hang, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about what we're going to kind of cover um, in sync up in terms of uh, topics about AI. Um, I won't go into the specifics. That's really just for sync up um, attendees virtually and in person. Um, but I really want to talk about what I see kind of coming in the future. You know, a couple of just so kind of just sobering realizations I'm having as I am, you know, obviously learning more and more about these generative models and, you know, what I think is happening with a lot of these uh royalty free and stock licensing music websites kind of what they are dipping their toes into essentially what's happening with a lot of the models that are going and training off of their content um it's going to impact us and i think there's going to be a large number of producers unfortunately that don't make it through it i just i see this kind of writing on the wall that um especially for the stock royalty free you know kind of I, I you know I want to I don't want to demean people who do it but it is the cheaper side of music licensing I mean just lower um, price points right and um, almost like easier much easier to just get your music into those catalogs you can almost basically anybody can upload them um, anybody who has an online YouTube channel or a um, podcast can basically go get that music and I just see that that's where a lot of producers are going to start to feel the kind of squeeze of AI technology and you know, right now is the time to up your game and basically start to improve your craft and to add more human dynamics and more human like elements into your music, more live recordings. Um, you you got to just take that extra time now to, uh, to to create more licensable music. I think the days of being able to just stack up a bunch of loops and rely on kind of presets where you're basically just clicking on one button and it's basically, you know, churning out a whole percussion section for you that stuff's got to go. Um, that's the kind of stuff that an AI model is definitely able to do now and will definitely just get better and better as time goes on. So kind of becoming a loop based producer or using anything that's kind of pre made like melodic loops, um, chord progressions, MIDI packs, you know, anything that's basically pre made, and you're just kind of functioning as the sort of AI robot that's just rearranging those things you don't have a chance. You just, you're not going to have a chance because these models are going to do that way better, way faster, um, way cheaper than you are going to be able to do it. So this is where I see this kind of day of reckoning coming for a lot of music producers that have been maybe eking out a little bit of a living for themselves. I'm not, I don't, I don't know if people who follow that production approach are doing extremely well, um, but probably making some money here and there. Um, I just don't see that as something that is going to be very tenable in the near future. Um, and it's, so it's first going to go into the royalty-free stock licensing world. But eventually, this technology will start to be introduced into our world. And so, you know, I don't know if that's going to be a year, five years, 10 years, you know, who knows. But I think now is the time to take this seriously and not to dismiss it, which is what I hear. You know, this is kind of a sad thing I'm hearing from some people. Um, that they're, they're, they're just saying, well, I've heard what Google Music LM can do and it's not that impressive, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Or they've heard what other gender of AI models can do and they're just like, eh, no big deal. That's not gonna ever catch up to me. I really just think that's a foolish move. I really do think that's burying your head in the sand and I think you're gonna wake up one day regretting that you didn't take AI seriously sooner enough and you didn't start to kind of AI proof your music and your production music specifically. So that's that's gonna be one of the focuses of Sync Up. Not exclusively, we are definitely gonna be focusing mostly on um, working with production music libraries, of course, talking to them directly. They're gonna be there at the event um, with that panel and you guys get to ask your questions and sort of get to know them a little bit better and really sort of pull the curtain back and get to know these people and get to know them on a human level. I think obviously with AI, we are kind of questioning and rediscovering what it means to be human. And I think that could be, a, there's no better sort of summary of what this event is going to be than human to human connection. Even if you guys can't be there in person, 
um, those of you that can even stream it live and submit your music to these library CEOs. My entire purpose of this event is to get you in direct contact with these library owners, CEOs, okay? Um, that's the entire point is because having human connections, human relationships, phone calls, direct emails with the people that are gonna be you know, representing your music and shopping your music, that's really where this this event's really going to either hopefully shine if it does really well i anticipate it will or maybe not so much if we don't do that uh, very well but um i'm i'm fairly confident even though it is my first time holding an event like this that the the ceos that i've uh, secured for the event are just solid guys um people i've done work with people that i know and they've definitely proven themselves in terms of their own businesses for the kind of placements they've received, how they've grown their own businesses, their own catalogs, all that kind of stuff. So I just think you, you can't find a better group of CEOs. And I don't think you'll find a better group of fellow composers to sort of network with and collaborate with. Um, one quick update on the Virtual Plus tickets. Yesterday, I had let you guys know that we had 20 um, of those Virtual Plus tickets. The Virtual Plus tickets, just so you know, are the ones where you can obviously stream the entire event live June 3rd and 4th, but you don't have to be there live if you're in a different time zone or if you're busy that weekend, you've got obligations. You can replay the entire event both days anytime you want to. Okay, I want to make sure you guys are clear. Somebody actually emailed me this morning thinking about getting a ticket, um, wanting to know if they could stream it afterwards. Absolutely. You don't have to be there live to participate. You don't have to be there live to uh, watch any of the panels or any of the presentations that we have going on. So, um, but what happened yesterday is we had six people actually sign up for those virtual plus tickets. So now we are down to 14 uh, virtual plus tickets. So they're going to go fast, guys. So I don't want to... Uh, you know, I don't want to have you guys sort of miss out on something like if you really wanted to um, stream the event live and obviously send your music to these library CEOs with a guarantee that they will listen to your music. That's actually what's going to be part of the uh, sort of program here with these CEOs that are attending. Um, those tickets are definitely going fast. And I think every day that I do these live streams, I'm sure a few more will be taken up and be uh, purchased. So and the reason why we're limiting that is that I don't want hundreds and hundreds of tracks to be submitted to these library CEOs and have them feel overwhelmed that they have to individually now listen to like 50 tracks each or something or 50 albums maybe if you guys are going to be putting together full albums for them. That's too much for one person to handle and I don't want to overwhelm them with this event. I want to potentially do this multiple times in the future. So I'm going to keep our numbers um, fairly small and fairly limited. So now we're down to 14 tickets uh, for those virtual plus tickets. So you guys should definitely get that. The link to get them is in the description box below if you want to. And just a real quick summary of who will be there, who the CEOs are that you can um, learn from. You can definitely talk or not talk to you if you're virtually attending, but uh, potentially ask your questions to them and certainly hear directly from them um, as we sort of ask them our questions and get to know them a little bit better. Uh, Mike Gennato, many of you guys have seen him on my channel. He's one of our uh, Sync Academy pros, also a pro feedback reviewer. So he gets some great uh, messages and reviews for us here in uh, on our platforms. Perry of Epic Music. Uh, Epic Music was actually the company that I personally partnered with for the syndicate. Many of you guys remember I had a private mentorship program where I would definitely offer licensing opportunities, give you guys some feedback, offer you some custom opportunities, all that kind of stuff. And Perry is obviously the uh, CEO, I think co-founder. They have they, Adam is another gentleman that works with them, and I think he's going to be showing up as well. So you actually have multiple people from this company showing up. Uh, but Perry's a solid guy, really, really good dude. Um, they are really strong in the sports placement world. They have done really well for us with sports placements. Um, not to mention, um, we did a Outback Steakhouse, com Steakhouse commercial with them back in, I think it was 2018 or 2019. Um, huge national commercial, did really, really well with them. So very legitimate guy, legitimate company. He's going to be there in person. Trevor Llewellyn, you guys know him. I think he's been on my channel many times. He's also our Sync Academy tutorial uh, educator, and he's also a pro feedback reviewer with Get It Done Music. So um, he's been in the business as long as I have, and he's also been both a composer and now a library CEO. So it's really cool about him. Same thing with Mike. Mike used to be, a, I think he still composes here and there, but really he's more focused on his company now. But both of these guys get it in terms of they've been on our side of the equation as well so they really know the struggles that we really go through uh troy with uh, alloy tracks really really nice guy really cool dude and huge placements so if you guys haven't seen um I'll actually pull up his website here real quick um just to show you some of the placements that uh troy has received um huge huge blockbuster movies trailers all that kind of stuff so he's done some amazing work and they do some great great stuff so if you wanted to work with a company like alloy tracks and potentially secure yourself 
uh, placements as large as this, then sync up is going to be one of your best bets to uh, get access to a guy like this, to have him listen to your music, to give you a shot. Um, and what's really cool is if you guys go to our website, um, let me go back here to sync up. If you go to the website, uh, all of these have clickable links. So you can actually go, the link is in the description box below here. So you can go click on the link and check out all these companies and do your research and find out, you know, just like the stuff that I teach you guys in Sync Edge, go find out what kind of placements they receive, what type of music they already hold, what music that they uh, represent. You can actually just see all that right now. And so you can kind of do a little bit of research here for a couple of weeks before the event happens. Um, how it's going to work if you get a virtual plus ticket is I will email all of you guys that have virtual plus um, tickets a private link to, it's basically gonna be a Google form submission link where you can select which CEO you wanna submit your music to. You get a little um, introduction for yourself, who you are, um, why you wanna work with this particular person, uh, a link to your music and a little bit of a blurb about, you know, essentially why you feel that you would be a good fit for this type of a company. So it's all gonna be very organized, easy for them. Most importantly, I want them to receive the submission packet essentially. Um, and everything's basically all in one place, really, really easy for them to go through all these submissions, listen to them and decide if they want to work with you, they will have your email address. You're going to put your email address in the submission as well, and they'll reach out directly to you. Okay. So it's not going through me. I'm not filtering any of that kind of stuff. I'm giving them a hundred percent total freedom and control to decide if they want to work with you to reach out to you and offer you a contract. I'm very convinced uh, that we're going to have a few people that are getting their contracts, uh, maybe maybe their first contracts, but also maybe second or third contracts through sync up. I'm pretty sure some of you guys showing up are going to have some amazing music. Um, and I think some of you guys are going to get some great um, opportunities through this event. So um, next moving on, we have AJ here. AJ is a really awesome guy. I've had a couple of conversations with him. One of them was on my podcast that's now sort of retired, but a really, really interesting guy, really cool guy. He has future hits here. Um, uh, really amazing stuff. Let me see if they have, yeah, they have some clients listed here. So you can check out some of the obviously huge uh, companies and networks and brands that they've, that he's worked with. And he's primarily a um, a vocal music guy. So most of his music, I think almost all of his music in his uh, catalog here is all about uh, vocals and pop music, EDM music, singer songwriter, as you can see. So definitely come and check out, you know, go to the, go to the link below. Um, you can kind of go listen to a lot of his music, listen to a lot of the vocal music, especially if you are potentially interested in getting some vocal music um, out there into the sync world, which I do highly recommend. If you guys know, I've been saying vocals are becoming more and more relevant, especially in the production music world, it's becoming more and more relevant. Um, but come in and check them out and, and click through any of these guys' websites and see what they're all about. Uh, Carlos is with Universal Music Group. He's actually an old college buddy of mine. Uh, he's now the director of new business, meaning that his job is basically to go out and try to find new sources of revenue. So he's not a CEO of a library per se, and he's not going to be included in the list of people that you could submit your music to because that's not his job at Universal. But he's basically somebody that's done a lot of work with TV film clients. So I'm basically bringing him on board because I want to pick his brain on exactly what it's like to try to make a TV film client happy. Because if we can get that insight, it's going to make us much more prepared to provide high quality, licensable, useful music to our production library partner. So if you, haven't tell, if you can't tell yet, a big part of this event is really about communication. You know, we need to communicate with production music libraries. We also need to start learning how to communicate directly with TV and film clients, or at least understanding directly what they want. So that's really what I'm hoping this event will provide for a lot of you guys is sort of pulling back that curtain, letting us communicate with each other, letting us know how do we serve each other better? How do we really make sure that these library owners are very impressed and happy with the music that we provide to them. And so you guys get to ask those questions and get that insight only here through this uh, sync up event. So uh, if you guys have any comments, questions about sync up or really just anything in music licensing in general, put it in the chat. You would really actually be doing me a favor because I want to keep this live stream going for at least an hour to train up my voice to just keep this thing going. So I'm gonna run out of stuff to talk about pretty soon and I'm gonna sit here just rambling about nothing and bore you guys all to death and you'll all tune out. So let's avoid that and let's make sure that we stay productive and make sure that I'm doing something useful for you guys. So put your uh, questions, comments, chat, anything in the box, um, in the chat box, I'd love to um, uh, answer those for you. Uh, and as we're waiting for those questions um, or comments or anything you guys got going on, uh, this is a quick look at the schedule for the event. So if you guys join us uh, for the live streaming event and do want to join us live, you are certainly welcome to do that. And there will be a live chat where I will I will try to field as many questions and comments as I possibly can. Again, there's going to be a lot of you. We already have, I think, 
want to say it's like 50 or 60 um, people. Actually, maybe it's even more than it might be more like uh, up to closer to 100 people streaming this thing live. Now, not all of those are going to be virtual plus members, but there's definitely going to be at least I think 100 people that have a virtual ticket. So if a lot of you, a significant chunk of you guys show up and actually watch, I, you know, there might be tons and tons of questions and comments. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to all of them. Um, people in the room are going to have priority because they're the ones that are sort of showing up there in person. But I will do my best for sure, my, my best to make sure that I try to keep an eye on that chat. And when we have a guest, when we have the CEO panel, when we have, um, you know, a guest speaker, essentially, I will do my best to try to field some of those questions. Uh, it, it might be possible and, and likely that some people that are in the room will be answer or asking some of the same questions you guys online might have. So that might be something where, hey, we don't have to answer your questions. Somebody else already asked that. But I will do my best to try to make sure that you guys feel very included in this event. So, um, but I, I do apologize if I don't get to everybody's comment or question. Um, it just might be just too many of you guys to, um, for me to realistically be, realistically be able to do that. So uh, Saturday and Sunday, June 3rd and 4th, that's when the event kicks off. On the first day on Saturday, we're gonna start with some uh, an introduction and a welcome from me. Um, I'm gonna give you guys essentially my kind of mindset overview of how to succeed in sync licensing. And I'm gonna give you my origin story, um, essentially where I was mentally uh, getting burned out in sync licensing. Some of you guys know my backstory a little bit that in about 2016, I hit a wall with TV film sync licensing and I basically just didn't even want to do it anymore. And I pretty much kind of gave up on it for a little bit. And that was when I went into kind of a bunch of different side gigs and hustles and things and just trying to make money in various ways that I possibly could. And then this kind of amazing sort of revelation, excuse me, hit me about creating Sync My Music. Well, eventually, back then it was called Music Makes Cash, which was a horrible, horrible name, lesson learned. And I eventually changed my business name to Sync My Music, but it kind of led me down this path to eventually putting on this event. I mean, it's just kind of crazy to think that it all started with essentially one thought I had back in 2016 that eventually kind of sprouted out and grew into this amazing, awesome community that we, that we have here. And you guys are the reason why this community is here, okay? I'm not gonna try to take all the credit. It's, if you guys weren't here, there is no community. So you guys are an awesome part of this. You guys that are gonna be showing up um, you know, in person for sure, you guys have made a huge commitment. I wanna thank all of you guys that have decided to get your tickets and I know it's it's not cheap to get your flight, to get your hotel, to you know book time, to get away from the family and all your obligations. You you're you're spending a lot of yourself uh, to come to this event, and I really want to just appreciate all of you guys that are doing that. Um, and I really hope that I deliver for you in terms of giving you the value that's worth your time, effort, and money. Okay. Um, and so that's what we're going to start with. And then we're going to do some interesting guided networking with each other. So I will sort of be um, giving you guys some prompts for what to talk about. And I'm going to be pairing you guys off. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if you're going to be there in person, you know, that anxiety of like, well, who do I go talk to? You know, I will take care of all of that. So you guys don't even have to worry about it. It'll all be taken care of. Okay. Then Mike Gennato of uh, Reverse Play will be our first guest speaker. And what I've definitely, uh, what I want from him and what I've asked him to do is basically to let us know what's happening in the world of TV film sync licensing right now in 2023 that are sort of some unhidden or unhidden, uh, some hidden un unknown opportunities in sync. So that's what uh, Mike's going to give us a little presentation on because I think especially as the AI stuff came into our world, we need to start opening our minds and our, our points of view on what we can do with our music, okay? I think we need to not be so pigeonholed and thinking like, well, we have to always get our consideration fee, our sync fee, and our royalties, and that's what we just always get, and that's what we're always going to do. That might survive for a long time. I'm not saying that's going to be disrupted tomorrow, but there might be some amazing video game or VR, AR, amazing uh, non-linear uh, licensing opportunities that if we are so married to TV film sync licensing, we sort of miss out on some of these other potential opportunities. So that was one of the big, you know, it kind of kicked my butt a little bit. The AI sort of revolution happening was it had to knock that, that sort of rigid thinking that I had. I just personally had that for too long. It just kind of knocked that out of me. And now I feel a lot more nimble and loose and flexible and not freaked out at all about AI. I was definitely freaked out about it when I first was learning about it. But now that I got my hand around it, I'm like, I'm realizing, okay, it's going to be powerful. It's going to be disruptive, but I don't think it's the end of the world. It's not the end of us. It's not the end of creativity or human music or anything like that. I don't think that's what's happening, but it is going to require that we adapt and evolve and change with it, right? So that's kind of where I'm sort of structuring some of these talks and having some of our guest speakers give it to us. And what I love about having Mike and Trevor and AJ coming to us is that 
These are their thoughts. This is their perspective. This is coming from them working in this industry as a music library CEO. I didn't want to be the person in front of you guys, you know, for two days straight, just giving you my opinions and my points of view. You know, some of them I feel it might be helpful and relevant, but really it's like, I want the people that are in those positions, basically running a library, telling us what are they worried about, right? I really want to ask Mike directly, what, what keeps you up at night? Like, what are you concerned about? What is it that you feel might come in and disrupt part of your business? And especially for your, um, your composers and your producers, who I know you have personal relationships with and you care about. What are your worries for them? And what are some things that you're, what conversations are you having with your composers right now to ensure that you guys stay ahead of all this this stuff? And Mike for sure is one of these guys that's just, he's such a futurist, like visionary. Like he's always looking at the future. He's always thinking about what is happening and how it can be an opportunity. I know that his point of view is very optimistic and very much he kind of sees these potential disruptive problems as opportunities for his company, for how he can serve new clients and new people and new sides of the industry with his production music. So I think he's a great fit for this um, this um, this uh, event. And I've never met Mike in person, so I'm really excited to uh, give him a big old hug and welcome to uh, welcome him to the event. It's going to be really cool. Then we'll take a little break in the middle of the day. Um, and by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, for these live stream uh, links, if you guys get your virtual ticket, um, it's going to be one continuous live stream the entire day, but we'll have two different li links, of course. So day one, I'm going to send you guys all a link just before 9 a.m. Um, Pacific time. So that live stream link will just be live all day long. It's gonna to be too complicated for me to stop it, send you guys a new email with a new link and all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna have basically one private link each day. So make sure you don't share that. That's just for you, those of you that got your virtual or virtual plus tickets. Um, so I'll send that to you for uh, Saturday uh, morning at probably 8.45, something like that. Um, and then if you, again, can't make it live, don't get it, it doesn't matter, just go to that email that I send you. You can click on that anytime and you can basically just scroll back and replay it any part of it you want to, okay? So um, you guys will have full access to that uh, in your inbox essentially and watch that from home if you want to. Then we'll come back, we're gonna do some live feedback with me. This is the first time obviously I've ever done something live uh, with people in the room. So basically I think we have about five or six tracks that I'm gonna start reviewing. And I think we'll be able to get through all of them in this hour. If not, we got some extra time actually on the second day to kind of catch up with anything we need to catch up on. But this will be really cool because we're actually going to have some, you know, submitted music from some of the in-person members wanting to get some real feedback. So I'm going to definitely give my best, um, my thoughts, my advice, uh, what I think can be improved upon it. And the new kind of angle that I'm giving on a lot of feedback, especially the pro feedback members that I've been reviewing their tracks recently is pointing out when I hear something that could be replaced by an AI algorithm. And it's it's one of these things I never thought I would have to start pointing that out, but I'm definitely starting to have to point it out. So that's something that's actually coming. Um, and as I give re uh, reviews and feedback to all the members um, here, I will definitely point that out. There was definitely one track from a pro feedback member last weekend when I reviewed it and I was like this part right here you're you're relying too much on a looped drum beat and a looped chord progression and a looped lead everything is very static and and, it, and I I know that an AI model can come in and do that right now probably better faster cheaper so I'm going to start to tune my ears to kind of hear that stuff and point it out. And it's not meant to pick on you guys or to try to, you know, tear you down, but just to kind of, you know, warn you to say if this is something where you kind of get too uh, reliant on this type of production music, of creating your music like this, you will feel the squeeze of AI faster than the per composer that's not doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so that's definitely going to be something really interesting um, and cool for us to do. We'll take a little break. Um, here at 2.30, and then we're going to come back. This is going to be essentially, I think, one of the main events of the entire event, uh, of the entire Sync Up event. It's going to be our uh, Music Library CEO panel, and this is where we're going to have these, let's see, one, two, three, four, five gentlemen joining us. Actually, no, sorry, uh, AJ won't be joining us for that. He's going to have his own little talk, but these four gentlemen will be talking um, to us. So those are the ones that will essentially all be in the room with us, and we can all talk to them, uh, ask them questions and all that kind of stuff. So that's going to be a great panel, and I've definitely got a, a list already of, I think, five questions, essentially, I'm going to have them do, and they're going to have them give them give us their kind of backstory, What, how did they get their library started, what niche segments of the TV film business do they serve, that's really important information for us to know if we're going to submit our music to these companies, like, what are the clients that they really focus on, that they've really found, that they got their foot in with, right? So that's going to be really cool, and I'm definitely going to ask them about AI, I'm going to ask them, like, what is worrying you guys, What is what is your opinion on it? Also, you know, as you guys saw with that Pond5 situation where they came in and let AI models come in and train on their tracks, 
I'm going to ask these library CEOs, if an AI company comes to you guys in the future and says, you've got a great catalog and we need some really high quality music to train our models on, we'll pay you up front. Will these library CEOs say yes to that? Are they going to be open to that? Are they considering that? Have they thought about that? These are the kind of conversations we all need to be having, having right now, because unfortunately what happened with the Pond5 situation is it just happened right and there wasn't sort of a little bit of a buffer time for you guys for those of you that have pond 5 music to potentially take your music off the platform and say well i just don't want my music to be trained i appreciate the offer but no thanks right at least the audio jungle situation that are they are giving you guys and by the way i think that clock is ticking away i think you got a couple of days if you want to take your music off of audio jungle if you do i'm not trying to say you guys should or shouldn't okay but I do what I do, why I'm in favor of is transparency and giving people options, right? I do want people to be fully informed about what they're getting involved with, what they want to do with their music, and knowing for sure what the risks are, okay? That's kind of one of these things where I want to make sure that I'm telling you guys, AI can make some amazing promises and some great things for us in our in our careers in the future, but let's not pretend it's all roses and sunshine. It's just going to be amazing for all of us. Like it is going to disrupt things and it is going to potentially threaten and change um, our way of doing business. So that is going to affect us. So I see that as something that we need to just kind of keep our eyes open to. So I'm going to ask these CEOs uh, these these tough questions. So um, if you guys want to ask your own tough questions, you're, you're free to do that. But I do want to be sort of the quote unquote bad cop in the room that I definitely will ask them some of these tougher, um, more challenging questions because it's important. I think, you know, we all need to start thinking about it. We need to be the adults in the room uh, and not be freaked out about it. And, we not, and definitely not put our head in the sand and pretend like it's not a big deal. We need to start to actually, you know, have these really important conversations with the people that are kind of of you know helping us get our careers off the ground and um and get those placements so that's going to be really really cool and we're going to do a little vip dinner um, with a few of the in-person members afterwards that'll be fun then day two assuming i still have a voice i think i will uh we're going to start off with aj gundle he was the one that was working with uh, future hits who does primarily vocal music for sync licensing really really great guy as i said before and he's going to join us virtually via zoom um he's on the east coast so having him come out just wasn't feasible but he's going to be there available for us to you know ask him questions about what makes a licensable track in his opinion what kinds of vocals would he feel makes it work what kind of lyric t topics um you know any sort of insights he can give us in terms of what's really uh, in demand right now in the tv film sync world in 2023 this year we're going to learn about that from aj so you're going to get your vocal questions answered there that'll be really great we'll do another little networking break and this is where for those of you that will join us in person we're going to do uh if you guys want to do some pictures together or just kind of hang out i also need to get some of your testimonials if we're going to do this again i really need those of you guys especially those of you that are going to be joining us in person um, if you're finding it a valuable network, uh, a valuable event, and you're loving the networking opportunities and all that kind of stuff, I need you to get on camera and I need you to tell people it was a great event so that we can potentially do this again. So that those of you that are joining us virtually, if you wanted to maybe join us in person, it just didn't work out this year. I want you to hear directly from the people that were in the room, what they really felt about it, what they thought, um, and why they felt hopefully that it was worth their time, money, and effort to uh, show up in person. All right, then we're going to come on. Trevor is going to give us a really interesting deep dive into AI um, and what tools he's personally using as a library owner right now to thrive and to basically offload a lot of his busy work and to automate a lot of things that have previously taken up a lot of time, including metadata and sorting and organizing and all this kind of stuff. So he's been um, watching this space very, very closely, actually longer than I have. And so I really wanted to invite him as a you know music composer and a music library owner for some perspective on what is he thinking about AI? What tools, what actual tools are he, is he using? What does he feel about the future of how it's going to affect our industry and his business as a music library? So that's gonna be another, um, you know, basically another perspective from somebody in the business. Then we'll take our second lunch break for day two. We're gonna come back and this is where we're gonna have Carlos Rios of Universal Music come and uh, give us a little bit of a talk about how he makes clients happy what makes their lives better, what makes their lives worse uh, in his experience, like what is essentially, what what is it that music library producers need to know about how TV film clients work, what are their considerations, and basically how does he cater music to them, right? Does he put together playlists for them? Is he getting on the phone? Is he just giving them a sort of carte blanche? Here's our entire catalog. Here's how you search for it. Like I want to learn, and I'm sure you guys want to learn, how does that entire process work so that we can try to put our tracks in the right place for the right people at the right time for those placements, right? Now, this is the important one too. This is a really important one that I decided to recently add to this event. This is gonna be my AI proofing your music presentation, okay? 
So as we've already been talking about, this is going to be a, a challenging time because I think, believe it or not, you know, I think that uh, probably about, I think at least, and this is going to be a big statement, okay? So, you know, we'll see if I'm right about this, but I think at least 50% of music producers that are in the stock licensing world and probably in the TV film licensing world are going to get I don't want, I don't want to use the word replace, but I'm going to basically say that you 50% of you guys are going to feel in the, in the next couple of years that AI is becoming your competition. Okay. I'm not saying that you're doomed and you're, you're there's no future for you, but I've, you know, I'm, I'm in an in interesting, unique position guys, because I have listened to a lot of production music and a lot of uh, composers that have been trying to get their music into production music libraries. Right. So I had my syndicate program for many years. I now have pro feedback. I think I've listened to Definitely hundreds, easily hundreds, but I, I, it's probably in the thousands now. Thousands of tracks um, from many producers, all different walks of life, all different types of music, all different types of genres. So I've got a kind of unique perspective on terms of like knowing how many producers I feel um, are making music that can be replaced by an AI model very soon. And I think 50%. It might even be more than that. I might be being kind of generous there. It might be more than, um, or I should, I should say I was being conservative. It might be more than 50% of producers, at least the music that I've heard. You know, I worry for you guys because it, you're going to have to step up your game because a lot of these ne these models and what they can do, and this is not meant to just try to scare you guys or to freak you out. I, I hope you guys know that I'm not, I, I'm not trying to just fear monger here. But I'm just being realistic that these models are going to get better and better and better. And if you're not getting better and better and better, um, this, it's just going to be a new reality where you have to worry about an AI model taking the work that you potentially could have gotten. So one of my biggest reasons for putting this into this um, presentation, into this event, is because this is the time right now, even though production music hasn't been disrupted yet by these AI generative models, this is the time that we need to really update and upgrade our music. And I do think a large number of you guys are going to need to take this advice very, very seriously right now, okay? So moving forward, as you create more and more music, you want to make sure that your music kind of goes into that sort of premium, organic, human-made uh, section of the production music library world, because that's kind of how I see the future rolling out here, that the AI music will eventually kind of creep into a lot of the background music, um, functional music, transactional music, music that's like people that are watching TV don't even know really or notice that there's even music there. Uh, it just kind of serves a very, very basic kind of like filling the gaps or fill, you know, uh, killing the silence sort of a, a function, right? That's going to be AI music because uh, it's just going to be faster, cheaper, easier to do. But I do think that there's going to be this kind of premium um, amount of music that's just higher quality, human created and, and organic, of course. And I think there's going to be huge, huge premium opportunities. Just like when you go to a grocery store, the organic section is usually the more expensive one um, because it's just been, you know, it's been developed a little bit more, you know, thoughtfully and has some more restrictions on how it can be cultivated and manufactured and processed and all that kind of stuff, right? So I think we're going to see the same thing in the production music library world. And so my aim for all of you guys that want to make this a full-time gig or at least, you know, sustain yourselves with some part-time income for a long time is I want to move you guys all from that kind of stock background, you know, transactional music into the premium, high quality, organic section. That's where I really think we all need to start thinking about moving into. That's why vocals are very important because vocals will be a big part of doing that. Um, but there's going to be some other things you can do right now to start to adjust. And it's not big stuff, guys. This isn't going to be like you have to reinvent yourself and learn a whole new DAW and go to a completely new world or something like that. You don't have to do anything like that, okay? All you have to do is essentially start to um, uh, add more human elements, human dynamics, and basically human emotion into your tracks. That's really what you guys need to start doing. So I'm going to give you some sort of overview on this presentation on how you can start doing some things. And there's also some things that you need to stop doing if you are doing them right now, okay? So I'm going to give you sort of a list of both of those and basically how to maintain your relevance in this industry, how to ensure you start having some really productive, helpful conversations with the people that are working with you with as production music libraries. This is the kind of stuff that we really want to make sure that we're doing um, in this business so that we're not going to get left behind by a lot of this AI stuff coming on board. And then we'll do our last networking break and we'll do a live feedback session with some Q&A at the very end um, if we have any sort of outstanding questions or anything like that, okay? So you guys now have only 14 chances to get those virtual plus tickets, okay? So six of you guys grabbed them yesterday. We now only have 14 left. So you can get them here. The link is in the description box below of this video. You guys can go check 
check them out. Um, just click on this link and then you can upgrade. If you want to get the virtual plus, you can upgrade that one um, just by clicking on this and then you'll have an upgrade option at the uh, checkout page as well. So this is going to be a great event. I'm excited for it. Obviously, I think this will be something that will, um, you know, I think on our first run around, we're going to realize like, is this something we want to do more often? Is it something we maybe don't want to do? Um, it just kind of depends on how valuable you guys find it. You know, if you guys are enjoying it, if you guys are finding it something that can uh, help open doors for you and certainly allow you to sort of network with other people, I think that's where um, the value really will come. And so if we get a lot of positive feedback, if you guys tell me that, yes, that's exactly what I got out of it and I really really enjoyed sort of how this this uh, event was put together then I think we can do this multiple times um, whether or not it's in person or just virtual you know that'll be remain to be seen uh, obviously a, a purely virtual one is a lot easier to, to plan but I do I get it and I think I'm craving also a lot of in-person just you know interaction essentially just more physical real world interaction so that's where I'm hoping um, we can kind of go with this but again I you know we'll, we'll kind of just see how it works out and uh and just sort of roll with the punches. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely now, as you can tell, running out of things to say, but I wanna keep talking. You guys haven't given me any questions. You're not helping me at all right now. So I'm really, really struggling. If you guys have any questions about sync licensing um, or the event, please put it in the uh, comment section below. I don't wanna end this one, um, but I'm certainly not gonna sit here uh, just rambling for another 25 minutes. So that, that won't be fun. I'm not gonna do something like that. D Brizzy, I don't know if you're still watching, but thank you for commenting. Laura, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you guys are are uh, are hanging out with us. Um, yeah, I feel like I've I've ran to the bottom. I've got nothing else left <laughs> with this one. I was really, you know, um, honored and and pleased that our in person and premium tickets sold out. Like that was kind of like I was a little bit shocked. I didn't think for a first time event that would necessarily happen, but it did. And it obviously it sold out because I capped the amount of people that I wanted at this event. I think if I didn't cap it, we probably would have had closer to a hundred people showing up. Um, and I just felt like early on, especially as a first time event, I don't think I wanted to deal with that. That was just too much. Um, that was too much pressure. Uh, an event with a hundred people can get really chaotic, um, you know, trying to rally everybody together and, you know, tell them, Hey, get out of the hallway, get back into the room. We're starting our next session and all that kind of stuff. It just felt like it would be too, too much. Right now we're around 50, 50 or 60 people that are going to be there in person. And I feel like that's a manageable number for me. And that's going to be something where I feel like it's, it's kind of a small, uh, knit, kind of um, just like a hang, you know, I wanted to feel more like a hang rather than like a big kind of corporate event or something like that. I mean, maybe this will grow to something bigger in the long run, but I wanted to just create something a little bit, you know, smaller and uh, more intimate and something that we can kind of just hang out um, together. So I think that's where we're going to go. So thank you. You guys are helping me out. J.I., what's up, man? Maybe the CEOs could prepare some interesting data that would be happy to share. That's exactly what they're going to be doing, J.I. I mean, with these um, presentations here, um, uh, we've got uh, Mike Gennato. He's basically going to be telling us about the opportunities that he's seeing in sync licensing. So whether or not that's in the form of data, you know, I don't know if he's going to present it that way, but definitely you're going to learn about what these guys are seeing out there. So that would be um, really, really helpful for us. AJ right here, he's going to give us data in terms of what vocals are going to be licensable and what he thinks is really, really helpful for his TV and film clients, what lyrics, what qualities, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Trevor is going to give us all of his insights in terms of the AI tools that he's using. So that's going to be some helpful data as well. And you're going to have these other uh, four CEOs um, joining us for this panel. And they're going to be telling us all about what they are learning in the industry and what's uh, what's going on there. So um, in terms of data, I don't know exactly what you meant there, but basically you're going to get a lot of direct insights from the people in this industry that live and breathe this stuff for their living. You know, they're paying their mortgages, they're paying their bills uh, with this industry. So that's going to be something that could be really helpful. So uh, Isomatic, you're going to grab a virtual plus ticket. Awesome, man. I'm glad you're going to join us. Don't wait. Uh, yesterday, six of them went and I'm sure today, maybe six more will go. So they're going to be going fairly quickly. So don't, uh, don't sit on that. The link is in the description box below. If you guys want to go get it. Uh, Volka's, uh, even my rambles have insight. Well, thank you. I, I sometimes don't feel so because they're my rambles. So this is like all repeated <laughs> thoughts and insights that I've heard myself say a thousand times. So I guess I get a little bit bored with it, but I'm glad that you're not getting super bored with it yet. That's good to know. Uh, J.I. is saying stuff we can't possibly know on the outside. So best and worst performing genres, best earning countries, percentage of usage in various mediums, percentage of tracks that get placed, et cetera. Um, maybe the data was wrong, wrong word, more like statistics. That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm not going to necessarily ask them to come to the event with all of that, 
But definitely you should ask them that. Like if you got an in-person or a virtual ticket, like you should ask them those questions and say, hey, what genres in your catalog are performing better in 2023? Or have you noticed any uptick in some genres that are getting more and more popular these days? That would be a really awesome question to ask, right? Um, uh, what could, when you accept vocals, uh, what, have, what lyrical themes do you find usually work better with your TV and film clients? What's the best performing, let's say, I, I'm sure a lot of these library owners will know, like you don't have to give us may, maybe the um, specific sync fee that you received, but what is one of the most, you know, the most valuable pieces of music in your catalog in the last 12 months, right? And that had vocals and what, what was that track and what was it about and what were they singing about, all that kind of stuff. These are the kind of the, the questions that I'll certainly be asking and I hope you guys will ask these questions directly as well. So I, I don't necessarily want to say, hey, can you go ahead and do a deep dive into your data and bring a whole presentation together. Uh, they might decide to bring some information like that and that's cool, but I really wanted to keep it fairly easy and like low homework for them, if that makes sense. I don't want them to feel like this is homework and this is gonna be like, ugh, I gotta go dig up data or that kind of thing. I really just wanted it to be more about, hey, could you guys show up? Could you just be open? Could you you know, uh, make yourself available to us? Could you just have conversations, answer questions, all that kind of stuff. Now, of course, Mike and Trevor have a little bit of a higher, um, uh, you know, uh, whatever you call it. I have basically asked them to to create their own presentations. So they have a little bit more homework to provide for this uh, opportunities and for this event. So they're definitely gonna get um, some more in-depth information for us. So that'll be really, really helpful for them. But for the other guys, I really wanted to make sure it was just more about like, just show up, you know, give us your insights, be transparent, let us know what you're doing, what you're working on, what you feel um, would be helpful for us to know. And I know for a lot of the members that are gonna be joining in, in, in person and virtually, they are thinking about partnering with you. You guys they really want to be you know submitting music to your company so let's let's just ask you know just be transparent with us and let us ask you some of these questions that would let our our members know if you're the right partner for them and that's where they want you guys to be able to feel like empowered to talk to these people i remember when i first got started in sync licensing i always felt like i didn't really deserve to be with some of the bigger companies i was like well i got my one company that i'm with but i'd see these other big ones and go like ah, i just probably don't I'm probably not good enough for them and they, they probably have too many producers and who am I? And it was a lot of self-defeating, limiting beliefs that I had. And I know a lot of you guys have those right now. And my goal is if you show up in person or you have a virtual plus ticket and start working with these companies directly, you will realize after this event that these are just human beings just like you and I, okay? Put on their shoes, go to the toilet, pay their bills. They do the same things that you and I do, okay? And they're just doing exactly what we're doing in terms of they're just trying to provide a service. That's all they're really trying to do. They're trying to be helpful and useful to both TV and film clients and to us composers, right? So they're kind of in the middle trying to make sure they're making both parties happy. So they have a really tough job. Um, you know, we, we don't, we're not always super thrilled with what they do for us or don't respond to us, that kind of a thing. But they are important partners. They're definitely a reason why I was able to create full-time income with my music. So I really, really do appreciate these um these guys and I think they're going to be um, very very accessible and easy uh, to talk to and I think by the end of this event that's what my hope for you guys is going to be you'll realize I can work with these companies like they're not like these giants way out here that I'm not like able to communicate with or to partner with I I, I hope it'll feel much more accessible for you guys after this event that would be a kind of a cool sort of a um, benefit of this event um Volkos is asking if I've been implementing AI in my work currently you know I just started getting back into producing some music I haven't really been producing music my own music for a while and the only AI um uh well let's just music for non-music work lots of AI stuff I've been using uh, article summarizers YouTube video summarizers um even some video editing software that automatically edits some of my video parts like i've been using ai in many different parts so but when it just comes to music the only one really that i've been messing around with is um isotope ozone 10. they have that sort of automatic ai mastering sort of assistant plugin and i've been playing with that a lot to see like is it good do i like what it creates and I'd say right now it's mixed. Sometimes I click it and it basically analyzes your track and creates a whole mastering chain for you. Um, sometimes I like what it does and other times I, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I think I could have done something a lot better than that. So I'm not saying, I'm not seeing it being a consistent thing that could be helpful, but I also haven't used, um, there's a feature in that where you can actually upload a reference track. So if you had a track, you're like, well, I want it to sound like this artist or this track. Um, it can basically analyze that track, then listen to yours and sort of like try to get it closer to that one. So I haven't 
haven't messed with that feature yet. That might be really impressive. We'll see. I got to see for myself. Um, but right now, that's the only, I think that's the only AI music sort of tool I've been kind of messing around with. But I definitely am looking around to see what else is out there. Um, and I'll, I'll certainly um, provide those to you as I, um, as I find them. Uh, Nick, what's up, man? Uh, at least it looks like the government is jumping right on AI and making them aware that it won't get away with not paying artists. Unlike how labels drop the ball on MP3 and file sharing, they should have started encoding everything right away. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we are definitely, I think, fortunate. I agree with you, Nick. We are fortunate right now because we got to be learning about this AI stuff before the AI models were really, really good. That's not what's happening with the uh, visual and photographers, visual artists and photographers. They kind of just woke up a lot of them going like, what? Like you just trained on all of our pictures and my, my art and everything. And like, I don't get paid for any of that. So, and those models are already really good and very, very impressive for what they can do. So they're kind of sort of having to climb themselves out of the hole now and do some class action lawsuits and try to really sue their, you know, sue the people that are doing this and try to sort of fight back for their rights in that way. So we'll see how that kind of plays out. But yeah, I, I do agree with you that like musicians, because these models are not amazing yet, um, it's really, really cool that we able we are able to look at this stuff, get curious about it, learn about it, and definitely start talking about it before the models become commercialized, right? And that's where we have a little bit of breathing right, room right now. And whether or not there's gonna be a, you know, um, a new law that has to, I don't, you know, I'm not really sure how much of the laws have to necessarily change because I think copyright law probably, I'm not a legal expert, but I, my guess is the copy, current copyright law that already exists could probably kind of handle a lot of what's going on here because I think we all can see clearly, you know, non-legal opinion here, but an AI model going and training off of your music and then spitting out music later um, is something that having to do with copyright. <laughs> you know, how exactly uh, it's an infringement, that's where you'd have to kind of get a legal uh, lawyer involved with that. But I think that's a pretty clear case that you are going into a copyrighted piece of content and extracting value out of it and then producing new value um, afterwards. So, and I know the sort of, you know, a lot of people want to say, well, that's exactly what human beings do is we listen to music, we get inspired by it. I mean, the, the exact reference or the exact uh, advice I've been giving you guys is go get those reference tracks, right? Well, that for sure is going to be a part of, uh, that's a very, you know, it's a very close uh, analogy to what's happening with these AI models. But obviously the big difference is that an AI model can do it a billion times in a day and can chain out, generate tons and tons of music that is very, um, it reduces the value of the original artist's music. And that's definitely one of these considerations for copyright violations, where is it transformative? Are you basically just remixing and changing things to the point where it's not affecting the original artist? You know, if you can have a generative model that basically went and trained on all this co copyrighted music and then create music, you know, just as high quality and it could potentially replace it, you know, meaning stock music and production music libraries, which would basically replace the income of all these producers, we've got an issue there, right? So, you know, but the other concern is, of course, okay, let's say they, they do pay us a one-time fee, which is what they're doing with the Pond5 situation. Well, great, they are sort of not, caught, they're not violating copyright because they are paying and your agreement with Pond5 allows them to do that, allows Pond5 to find new revenue models for you. Do we want to do that, right? Do we want to take a little bit of money to allow an AI model to essentially become us in the long run, right? Can it do that? When it'll do that? We don't really know that. So, Challenging stuff, guys. It's really challenging. I don't have all the answers. I know some people were in some of the comments asking me, well, what, what do we do then? Like, you're, you're kind of pointing out all these issues. What do we do about it? I don't really know. I'm, I'm not sitting here telling you I'm Nostradamus and I know the future and I know what we can do. I know that being transparent about stuff and just being honest about stuff lets us at least make hopefully more informed decisions than not being informed about the stuff and not knowing what's happening and being in the dark and just going, I don't know, either giving into that kind of feeling of like, well, what's the point of anything anyways? Let's just give up on all of it or pretending like it's not going to be a big deal. Uh, either one of those, I think is going to be a bad look for us. We don't want to go in those directions. We just want to be curious, open, honest, and transparent about what's, what this stuff really can mean, how it can really affect us, and then hopefully try to navigate this stuff the best we can. And of course, um, you know, upgrading our thinking and staying on top of this, this stuff. I think it's just, that's all you can do at this point. Like you can't really make any big decisions right now. You can't really decide what you can do. Um, I don't think there's really much we can do at this point other than to just sort of learn, just learn and learn and learn as much as you possibly can about this kind of stuff to try to put yourself in a really good position for the future. That's basically the best we can do right now. So, um, 
Yeah, so that's what I was just talking about, Oliver, in terms of my position on opting in for your music on educating AI. I'm not in that position right now because I don't have any music in stock licensing, okay, in stock libraries. If I did have a significant amount of music in, let's say, Pond5 or Audio Jungle, would I take my music out? It's a good question. I don't know if I can give you one answer. It's it's hard. Like, if I'm not in the position, I mean, my, my instinct wants to tell me, take it out, right? My instinct wants to say... Don't take the upfront money. You're basically feeding a machine that could potentially replace you. Don't give into that. That's what I want to say. But I, you know, it's it's there's there's other factors as well. Like how much are they paying me, right? And also for myself, because TV, film, sync licensing was where I put all of my music. If I had stock music, it would probably be music that was just sort of like, eh, those are the ones that didn't get accepted by libraries, and I wanted to throw them somewhere rather than being on my hard drive, right? So maybe I'm not that attached to those tracks anyways, and I'm like, eh, if you replace my stock licensing, you know, if I was making like literally nothing, and the, and the data set music, the income I was making from that was a lot more, that's going to influence my decision. I'll be honest, that'll definitely influence it. So I don't know if I can give you guys an answer on that because I'm not in that position. So if I were, I would tell you, I'd say, this is what I did. This is what I'm deciding. I would just let you guys know what I'm doing. But because I'm not there, I don't have that consideration. I'm not exactly sure what I would really do. So I'm sorry, I can't really give you that answer. Uh, Nick saying, the main thing you look at is ozone is the EQ. If it uh, is the EQ, it it does, then I adjust my chain if I think it makes sense. Yeah, so that's the other thing with a lot of these ozone, you know, um, of the AI sort of ozone mastering thing. It's like sometimes it can just be a sort of starting point, and that's usually how I see it is it's just a starting point to kind of get you in a direction. And if it's going in a cool place, then kind of alter it or change things around and mess with stuff until it feels exactly how you want it. But it sort of just gets you started so you don't have to individually go through and like, all right, let's do the EQ, let's do the compression, let's do the limiting. It can maybe just get you started and then you go in and sort of fine tune stuff. And that's really what I see the promise of AI in the most is that just kind of like shortcutting some of these things that are like, we do it every single time. We do it every time we make a new track, every time we master something, right? So if I could create something that's just like, could you just do that, you know, and I'll come in and kind of fine tune the stuff that I need to, but can you just take care of all the boring work? Like, here's one thing I would love to do. Hey, AI, like, let's say that we had a future version of Logic Pro and I say, hey, AI Logic, create me a session, give me some amazing, awesome, you know, those are the descriptors I would use. Maybe I'd have to be more descriptive, but like, give me some great rock drums, a couple of tracks, rock drums separated from kick, snare, toms, and hi-hats, all the cymbals. Give me four guitar tracks, uh, have two of them stereo spread. The other two are going to be leads. Give me a big rock bass guitar and a really cool, crazy sounding synth stuttering effect and create a session that has all those instruments. And in a second later, it does all of that. Maybe adds a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQing in a, in a way that makes sense for stuff that I've previously done. I'll say, hey, use some of the same you know EQ or the same plugins that I've used in some of my previous uh, sessions. I, I would take that in two seconds easily. Why do I want to keep stacking up all these sessions and create new, you know, um, reload stuff? I was actually just doing that this morning and reloading guitars or reloading this. And it's like, yeah, that's why we use templates or whatever. But I think some other times it's like, you know what? I just want a great sounding guitar. I don't have to go open up the guitar session, the guitar plugin, get the amp, compress it, EQ, you know, all these extra steps where it's like, I just want to be creative right now. If I could just utter that and just say that and it did it, I mean, why wouldn't we want something like that? That would be really cool, right? Um, Volkus is saying, I'm currently also not in a position to create my music as well. However, learning the newer tech before getting in my swing will surely give me a home run eventually. Yep. Yeah, learning the new tech will certainly help, but I think there's nothing better than just putting your hands on the technology, like literally opening up a DAW session and working with new technology and actually starting to uh, compose new music. You're going to learn so much faster doing that than any other approach to this stuff. Um, you know, watching, going down the YouTube rabbit hole of watching other people using tutorials can certainly be helpful just to kind of get your, your, your head wrapped around it, but you're not going to really learn it until you actually start putting your fingers on it. And so you start clicking around and stuff. So, um, Jay, I saying I'm happy for other composers to reference my work. We are conscious enough and have morals to avoid copying, uh, some, <laughs> not all of us. There are a lot of composers that definitely straight up, uh, copy. Um, but I don't think you do Jay. Uh, AI can't even hear what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not listening necessarily. Um, and having that kind of conscious interaction with it is just basically it's data, you know, just here's some data. I'll store that data or at least the, the, um, uh, the, 
I guess the uh, pattern recognition of that data and and output some data later. So yeah, there's no like conscious, I don't think, um, thing going on there. So I feel like uh, Nick is saying, I feel like settling for one-time fee or subscription type fee will be another loss for writers. Like how are we getting ripped off of Spotify and others? Yeah, and it's possible because, you know, musicians, uh, that's the sort of trend we're all on, right? We're the first ones to get screwed over. We're the first ones that lose out of money. We're the last item in a budget for a film, right? If you ever looked at a, a, a film, uh, music is always the last one. It's the first one to get cut. It's the last one to get paid out. So unfortunately, that's just sort of where we are. But, um, you know, that's nothing new. We, we've kind of dealt with that our, our entire careers, right? How do you get started with sync licensing? I mean, how can you find potential clients? That's a great question. Uh, what I recommend, it's kind of a big question and um, I can't get into all the specifics on that, but what you should do is go to syncmymusic.com. I have a free course. It's a five part, five video court, uh, part course that will let you know exactly how to get started in sync licensing and it'll show you essentially my strategy for how I partnered with libraries, production music libraries, and how I started getting my uh, income going in there. So definitely go to syncmymusic.com. Uh, it's a free course and uh, you'll learn a lot in those five videos, I guarantee it. All right, uh, Mauricio, I'm a singer, songwriter, and producer, freelancer. I do full-time mostly on Fiverr. I see there's good demand for artwork images on the platform that could be AI generated instead, thoughts? Yeah, so artwork images, you know, that kind of stuff. Again, AI can kind of do that now. I, I think their, their quality and the size of those images are not huge yet. They're kind of small, so there's probably some limitations on it. But that's, I mean, that's a whole other world. I don't know all the specifics of, you know, the art world and visual arts and photography and stuff, but I've definitely seen a lot of the video, or not the videos, the um, videos are coming on too, but the pictures and the artwork that AI can do, it's, it's pretty good, guys. So yeah, if you're a visual artist, um, uh, that's that's something where you got to just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just don't know what you do about that kind of stuff. Um, I know that there are class action lawsuits and legal challenges to all that. So we'll see how that kind of plays out if that's going to stand up. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't have a probably an educated, I can't really tell you anything very smart about that side of it just because I'm more involved in the music world. Uh, Panufo is saying, in order to create authentic music, wouldn't AI have to learn how to operate a DAW? No, they don't have to right now. Wouldn't the individual instruments need their own tracks? Uh, possibly, but not necessarily. So um, we're, we're assuming that AI is like human beings, and it's not like a human being. So um, if you've looked at, um, what's it called? Uh, the Google Music LM, the one that I basically showcased on uh, the platform. I don't think that there's any DAW that's helping it create that. I don't know exactly how it's doing that, but I don't think that, that Google is using like Logic Pro to you know compose all that kind of stuff. There might be individual tracks, right? I don't know exactly how it's kind of stacking up the music or maybe it's all doing it all at once. That, that's one of those things where it's kind of like a black box. We don't really know how it's doing that, but you definitely don't need a DAW to create AI music. Um, their algorithms essentially are doing it, okay? So they don't, they're, they're sort of bypassing a DAW. And that's why I said in one of my presentations about a month ago that creating music with a DAW in the, in the, in the future, I don't know how soon in the future, but sometime in the future, uh, might seem like an outdated piece of technology. Now, of course, I think what will happen as well is AI tools will be incorporated into DAW. So Logic and you know um, Pro Tools and Ableton and all these kind of DAWs, you're going to see AI assistance and plugins and, and technology getting infused into it. You're already seeing that with the uh, Logic's uh, drummer. Um, I forgot what it's actually it's called, but it's the one that basically can create just a drum beat for you. You just say, hey, here's my track. Create me some, some a drum beat that sort of matches that up. So that's already AI right there uh, in your track. So you're going to see more and more of that coming into the future. So. Note Performer 4, don't know anything about that, Sebastian. Sorry, I can't give you any opinion on that. Uh, will AI be able to recreate elements of older generation music? Example, 50s rockabilly, 80s rock, including the more obscure production elements. Oh yeah, like anything audio-wise, like I don't see why it couldn't, because it could certainly go study off of that music and it could certainly go, oh, okay, this kind of uh, quality of this type of a track has these you know, leads or has this kind of reverb setting or something like that. So, uh, or it's the sense of the 80s sounded like this. So yeah, I can do any of that stuff. There's no reason why I can't go to older music as well. Uh, signature music services, the data sets are not going to be a regular income. They are just taking the most uh, interesting, usual, unusual. They are just taking the most unusual tracks. Got to look at the number of composers or tracks versus the money they have to pay out. Um, maybe I'm just not, my brain's probably frying right there. But I think what you're saying essentially that your data set income is short-term income. And I agree. Yeah, when you get your data set income from 
uh, Pond5 or Audio Jungle. I would not expect that to last forever. It'll probably be a short one-time thing. Now, what might happen though, is that like, let's say one company comes in and pays, studies all the music and you get that one-time data set payout, but you might have another company come in with their AI models and then they start training and they pay you guys. So you could have recurring sort of new sources of data set income. So it's not like you'll just get one paycheck. I, I can imagine you'll probably get a few different ones. So, um, you know, an income is income. I'm not gonna sort of just say that's terrible and you should never take it. Um, but of course, that is the sort of trade-off of like you get the short-term income and then it's this big question mark of what's going to happen and then the other element is like let's say let's say all of you guys that follow me you guys take all of your music out of the stock licensing website so let's say let's just say i'm not telling you to do this but just as a hypothetical we sort of unionize here and we all decide you know what don't take the money take your music off the website do you think everybody on those websites will do that i i don't think so i think a lot of producers forgot they put music on that website honestly like one of the producers that i had spoke, spoken to on my channel said he had forgotten that it was even he had he even had music on the website and i think probably that applies for a lot of the composers that just threw some stuff up there 10 years ago and forgot about it okay so even if we all decided to like take our music out of there i think there'll be plenty of music left over that it'll still be able to get what it needs so then you're sitting there going do I just out of principle say, I don't want this money? Or is it foolish to say, I don't want this money wherein it's going to get the music one way or another, I might as well get the income, right? So it's complicated guys. And I'm not here to tell any of you what you should do and what move is appropriate or not. It's, it's too complicated. I just can't do that. And I don't think anybody's selling out by taking the income. Like I know that some people have that pushback to say like, if you take that money, you're just, just you're, you're throwing us all down the drain and you're just gonna piss away all this great stuff that we've been doing. Eh, I, don't, I don't get on that kind of stuff because I'm like, we're not on the same team in terms of like, we are in the same team that we all make music, but we're not on the same team in terms of we all have the same lifestyle, the same obligations, the same, you know, like medical concerns, like having to pay for, you know, whatever, uh, you know, medications and doctor visits. I, I, you know, we all have very, very complicated, very uh, challenging lives. Each one of us do. And so I just want to say to any of you guys that have to make a tough decision, make it like be comfortable with whatever decision you need to make. You don't have to justify it to me or to anybody else. I, <laughs> I don't know. That's just where I'm at. I'm not going to ever back off of that kind of thing because it's like, you need to know that your decisions are your decisions and your life is your life. Okay. So there's no shame in either taking the data sets or taking your music off the website. If you feel that's the right decision, you just do what you feel is right. That's really where you got to go. Will DAWs implement AI as a stock plugin eventually? Um, probably, I would imagine, yeah, probably Logic. I could see them doing that where it just comes with some sort of AI. And that's already happening now in terms of that that drummer uh, assistant essentially in Logic. That's already built into Logic when you get it. So yeah, it's already here and that'll definitely come uh, come around. So Shiloh, my G chat GBD pot argue with me about a decade of auto-tune robot voices not being authentically original in legal support to itself. Interesting. Yeah, it, the thing with the chat GBT thing is that like it sometimes hallucinates. It sometimes just makes up stuff. It sometimes just says stuff. So it's an interesting technology and there's some useful parts of it. If you guys saw, I gave you guys some uh, how you can use it to essentially summarize any legal uh form that you get or any legal contract where it's like really complicated. It'll actually summarize it very quickly for you. But it's not perfect and even the owners of it and the people that put it out tell you this is not perfect and you basically need to fact check it and you need to obviously get a second opinion on stuff. So don't think of it as like it's just this all-knowing God that will always give you the right answer. It, it's not always gonna give you the right answer and sometimes it just does silly stuff. So, you know, just just it's interesting for sure, but just don't take it too seriously thinking that it's like got all the answers and it's it's gonna do, you know, lead you in the right direction every single time. So it, it won't do that. All right, we have crossed the one hour mark. Thank you to the 19 of you guys that are watching now. I really appreciate you guys and your time and your energy. Uh, definitely get your sync up uh, virtual plus tickets. Excuse me, if you haven't done it yet. There are only 14 left. This is going to be coming one of your last chances. Um, and I, I decided I'm going to cut off the, the virtual tickets next Thursday. So basically uh, about a week and a half from now, we will cut off all virtual tickets. Like nobody will be able to buy any more tickets because I need to have at least a day getting ready for the event, obviously setting up all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to be getting any new uh, comers coming basically one day before the event. So the link is in the description box below or you can go to syncbymusic.com. You'll see a banner at the very top. Get your virtual ticket, upgrade it to virtual plus if you want to have a guarantee that any one of these um, one, two, three, four, five gentlemen 
will potentially uh, sign you. They will definitely listen to your music, guaranteed, uh, and they will potentially sign you directly because you'll give them your email address and your music. So it's going to be a great event. Really excited for it. And I will do more of these live streams as we get closer and closer to it. So we'll see you guys very soon. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, giving me your great questions. For those of you guys that gave me those uh, questions and those comments, it helps because I was running out of stuff there around 30 minutes in, but you guys picked me right up and carried me to the finish line. So I really appreciate it. You guys have a fantastic day.